Welcome, Chappelle. Welcome to your flip classroom. And um, you know what? Y'all are way further than six feet away from me right now, so I feel like I could probably take this bad boy off. But welcome. Welcome to your very first flip. Welcome to the flipped classroom model. Welcome to Western Civilizations, which is going to be a really, really great class. I'm excited about teaching it again at Chappelle this year. I know we had an absolute blast last year with the class of 2022, so I'm really excited to see what the class, the class of 2023 can offer up, right? So Biggest thing we got to get into today, we got to kind of just outline how a flip works, what it looks like, right? Try to understand where we are in history and where we're going to be going, okay? So to get you to understand, first of all, kind of the model of this class, remember, this is your first flip, so what you need to be doing is making sure you're listening, making sure you're not muting, making sure you're taking good notes, making sure you're taking extra notes off in the margins if I say something extra or something like that, and just make sure you're kind of keyed into the whole thing. Learn a little something, jot your notes down. Bang, it's that easy of a grade to get, right? So biggest thing going forward, what, like Western Civ? Well, what is a Western civilization? Why is there a Western Civ and an Eastern Civ? We'll get into that discussion particularly tomorrow, all right? So tomorrow in class, we're going to end up talking about kind of what the big difference between Western, Eastern, these spheres, your understanding of history so far is going to kind of really be expanded upon tomorrow. But to give you a really, really quick thing that you need to jot down really, really fast before we get even started, before you've even written this, what you need to do is you need to kind of just like throw this out there. Western civilizations are defined as civilizations that have emerged out of the Mediterranean region, particularly starting with Greece and Rome. Okay, that is what creates the Western sphere. All right, that Western sphere kind of begins with the Greeks around 4,000, or is it 4,000 or is it 2,000? Might be 2,000. Actually, let me double check that. Um, let's see, Neolithic era Greece. Okay, I think it's 2,000. Nope, never mind. All right, so anyway, Neolithic, all this kind of started around like 7,000 BC, 7,000 years before Christ, uh, out of the Mediterranean region going into Greece. Okay, so but the thing about it is even before that even during that period of the Neolithic period within Greece There were other civilizations already around already making headway, right? And we refer to outside of Western civilizations We oftentimes refer to these as our ancient civilizations the ancient civilizations that we are about to talk about now Don't really fall into a category. They don't really they're not really necessarily considered Western. They're not considered Eastern They're the civilizations that kind of predate everything Western Okay, so getting into it, let's go ahead and get started, all right? Western civilizations, before we can talk about that, which we'll get into a little bit more tomorrow, we've got to talk about some of our ancient civilizations, right? So ancient civilizations mainly you have to understand that when we're dividing up history in ancient civilization periods, but outside of Western civilizations, we've got to divide history into two phases, okay? Very, very simply, when you talk about all of human history, all of the history of Homo sapiens sapiens, which is what we are, okay? It's a subspecies of Homo sapien, but we're not going to get into that right now. Uh, human history is divided into two phases, one of them being called the Paleolithic period and the other one being called the Neolithic period, right? And just so you understand the origins of these words, like the origin of these words actually goes back to their usages in the term stone age, right? Paleo meaning old and lithic meaning stone age or stone. It refers to the old stone age. That is our old stone age, right? That is our going all the way back to what you would probably say is like, oh, cavemen, right? Oh, but that's kind of neither here nor there. And that's a really, really obtuse kind of like umbrella term. But remember, Paleolithic is our old Stone Age time period. Neolithic being the one that we live in now, right, is our new Stone Age time period. Well, Paleolithic and Neolithic are divided up into these two groups because 40,000, or from about 40,000 BC to about 8,000 BC, that's considered the era of Paleolithic human beings, right? Those old Stone Age people. And then Neolithic is our new Stone Age people being 8,000 BC and forward, okay? So, so you understand, well, Mr. Terry, what's the difference between Paleolithic and Neolithic? Well, you know what? I'll tell you, Haven. Uh, Paleolithic is the era of hunter-gatherers, all right? So hunter-gatherers are these people that have a lot of defining characteristics. They live a non-sedentary life, okay? They are originally going to be people known as Homo sapiens sapiens, okay? So you understand humans have gone through multiple transitions, right? Starting all the way with 
Australopithecus being the very, very first type of human being that we are aware of, going all the way through up to Homo erectus, and then to Neanderthal, and then to Cro-Magnon, and then to Homo sapien adultu, and now to Homo sapien sapien, right? We are Homo sapien sapien. Now, the first Homo sapien sapiens that appeared around 10,000 BC are going to be Paleolithic people. Right? They are considered to be like the developmental peak of these old Stone Age people due to the fact that it's, of course, what we are now, and then also that they had larger brains. They had the ability to wield tools. They had the ability to make weapons. Right? Hunter-gatherer societies are also stratified into these family groups. Right? And the biggest key thing about Paleolithic people, these hunter-gatherer societies, is that they are nomadic. All right, they're nomadic. Nomadic means, you need to jot this down next to nomadic if you don't already know what it is. It means people that move from place to place to find food. So let's say hypothetically my B period, right? We're a nomadic band of people, right? We would be a band because actually civilization goes band, tribe, chief, and state. Now, if we were a band of individuals, because there's only about like 25 of us, right? Uh, as a nomadic hunter-gatherer, Paleolithic era people being like around before 8,000 BC, we move to find our food, right? The biggest thing about it is we don't settle in permanent settlements. We do not create our own food. We use what the planet offers, right? We would go off and find game to hunt. We would go off and find berries or food to harvest, right? And that's very, very important because as those resources deplete, the encampment or that band of people must move. That is how Paleolithic people survived, right? Now, ironically enough, there are still some nomadic groups of people around, places like New Papua New Guinea uh, and other areas in the Southeast Asian, uh, Southeast Asiatic islands do share some current day traits with Paleolithic people, even though ironically enough, they live in a Neolithic era, all right? So big thing though from that entire spiel, nomadic, right? Nomadic, they had the ability to move around to find food. Other big stuff, Paleolithic people, Homo sapiens sapiens, are also going to start showing signs of religion, right? So, well, and it's not a very intense religion. It's not like a very, very, it's not orchestrated. Probably they don't have any real understanding of maybe necessarily what God is or anything close to what Christianity is now, as considering the fact that this was 10,000 years before Christ was even born, right? So the earliest signs of religion were known by one thing, burying the dead, okay? So you understand that where it says early signs of religion, underneath that, right, burying the dead. Paleolithic people around the era of 7,000 BC began to show extreme signs and an uptick of burying the dead with small goods from their life, right? Like if I was a part of our band, right, and I had died, you might bury me with my football because it's something that I always had with me. And you also are burying me for one key reason. You don't want my body to be eaten by scavenging animals, right? And so you, in that relationship, we are kind of starting to believe that Paleolithic people showed the earliest signs of religion because they wanted to preserve bodies, okay? So that's a huge step forward for humankind, Homo sapiens sapiens being the first ones to do that. Now, we're also going to see a gender division of labor in Paleolithic period. Men would oftentimes be in tasks with hunting, fishing, sometimes defense from other bands of people. Something you got to understand is Paleolithic people do not have what is known as like law and order, so they could kind of just kill each other at will, all right? So Big thing about that, though, some men would often be times, uh, oftentimes be used as defense or would possibly encounter other bands of people that were also moving around. So also, something else you need to understand, that women had a defined role in the Paleolithic hunter-gatherer scheme as well. Mostly gathering, making medicine, uh, caring for children, right, like in f small knit family groups. The other big thing you need to understand is that all human beings, all human beings everywhere originated from the continent of Africa. All right, so... That origination is actually tracked even all the way into our genes. We have a thing inside of our genes known as mitochondrial Eve, right? A small genome that actually is believed to be in our mitochondrial DNA cells that is believed to be related to the first original mother of all humans that we call Eve, right? Mitochondrial Eve, though, the actual like prehistoric person. So it's a very, very neat thing. And all human beings, like I said, spread from Africa right around 200,000 years ago. Okay, so, and they begin to kind of spread out all over the entire earth, and it's a very, very amazing concept, all right? So, and that is going to be this large migration. So, as you can see, we believe human beings originated right around here and then begin to spread all the way around, okay? And then as time goes on, humans in different regions are going to evolve different attributes. Skin tone, because of the distance from the equator and the lack of melanin in their skin, needed to actually protect them from UV ultraviolet light. Changes in 
like size, changes in body mass density due to diets and other like kind of things that are around them, okay? So going forward though, then we're gonna hit this phase called the Neolithic Revolution around 8,000 BC, all right? So circa 8,000 BC, the Neolithic Revolution occurs. And really quick, kind of taking a step back, what do you think could be the thing that takes people from hunting and gathering and moving all over the place and being nomadic and having those gender divisions of labor and spreading out of Africa to kind of creating life in a civilization-like platform, having certain structures, law and laws, different ideas, customs, like religious faiths that become a little bit more structured, bureaucratic governments, all these things. What could be the thing that started that transition, right? Every transition starts with something. Going from Paleolithic to Neolithic had to start with something as well. So what development do you think could have changed the course of human history and led to the world that you know today? Led us to the ability to have school inside of a building, to build this building, to create this desk that is I'm like sitting the computer on. What could that have been? Well, it was farming, all right? Farming, agriculture was the biggest development around 8,000 BC that occurred, giving human beings the ability to stay in one place, all right? So the development of plant and animal domestication are going to change everything, okay? So notice it says the development of plant domestication. Plant domestication came first, okay? Plant domestication is very, very important because humans began to select very specific crops, which we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go, um, and sp select specific mutated crops from the wild that they would actually be able to use at their disposal, and they would selectively breed those plants over time to create the foods that you now encounter now. For example, corn, when it was originally found in North and South America, was a very, very small weed-like plant. Very small, would kind of grow everywhere, and had these tiny little kernels, and it was only about as big as your thumb, right? Very, very small. But Native American Americans began to, in times of famine, used to have to turn to eating that particular crop. But what they would do is they would begin picking ones that were a little bit bigger and a little bit softer. So maybe instead of picking the one that was about the size of your thumb, maybe they would pick one that was about like this size. Maybe the kernels were a little bit softer. That mutant crop would then be replanted, and then that would mutate and would be replanted, and it would be replanted. And now we have ears of corn that are this big, soft, and easy for human beings to eat because we selectively bred it over time, right? So cultivating agriculture, it's a massive thing, okay? Uh, another big example is peas. You can talk about pea pods, green pea. I love peas. I was supposed to have them for my lunch, but I forgot it at the house, all right? So anyway, the outcomes of this are then going to lead to Animal domestication, which is another really, really amazing thing. Being able to have meat that is accessible at all times. Milk, dairies, poultry, uh, swine is going to be a big, big thing, right? An amazing thing, actually, considering the fact that only 14 types of mammals are actually able to be domesticated whatsoever out of the hundreds of types of mammals that exist all over the world, right? So plant and animal domestication is going to lead then to concentration, right? We're going to start seeing less and less Neat, or Paleolithic hunter-gatherer band type tribes and people, and they're going to start creating towns and cities, and they're going to start grouping themselves together. Now, next to this towns and cities, I need you to write down one other very, very important concept. This is all due to creating a surplus, all right? So during plant and animal domestication around 8,000 BC, you started seeing a creation of a surplus, right? A surplus of food, as in my, myself, if we were now a city to ourselves in the Neolithic period, instead of being a nomadic gathering, like roaming around type of people, I would be able to farm more than my family needs, and then I would actually give that to the town itself, right? And that surplus would make it so other people didn't have to farm. So then that way in our little community, Mr. Mathern now doesn't need to farm because I have created that surplus. So what can Mr. Mathern do? He can specialize in a job. So that's what we're talking about right here. Specialized jobs, right? Artisan jobs. A-R-T-I-S-A-N. -A -A Jot that down, right? Specialized jobs. Next to that, artisans, right? Artisans could be anybody from blacksmiths or uh, what else? Blacksmiths, uh, Tanners, people who would actually create leather and cloth, textile workers, anybody who had a specialized job outside of agriculture, right? And then another thing that came up is regional trade. Let's say hypothetically there was a little civilization nearby us because if we're living in an area and farming and doing all this stuff, we're going to attract attention. Somebody else starts there. It's a little like village or town. Now we can create regional trade, right? Now we can trade with one another. Oh, I have all these cows and you have all that wheat. How about we trade those two things, right? Regional trade is another huge outcome of the Neolithic revolution. 
Now, technology is going to be another big thing. Due to the creation of surpluses in artisanal jobs and specialized jobs, it's going to create kind of a natural capitalistic system, leading to human beings trying to create tools to better their lives and make certain jobs easier. The best example is like a scythe, right? A scythe is the curved image that you can see, uh, like um, the Grim Reaper carries. That's for reaping wheat, right? It's actually for cutting wheat down, and that's just a simple bladed tool, right? But that is technology. That is very simple. I know a lot of y'all think this is technology. The technology get, like moved along very gradually at first. Then also, it's going to lead to writing, which we'll talk about with the Mesopotamians, and art, which we're going to talk about later on as well. So all these amazing things came out of just a simple invention of agriculture. But are there negatives? Could there have been any negatives that come along with the farming idea? Could there be, I don't know, a lot of you are probably like, oh, I mean, this sounds pretty dope. I like the idea that I can, you know, go home and eat a Hot Pocket and, you know, watch TikTok. <clears throat> All right, so anyway, the big thing about it that you have to understand is that there were some negatives that come along with farming. Because naturalistically speaking, nobody is supposed to be able to do the things that humans quite have the ability do. We've created language, we've created art, we've created writing, we've created rockets that can send human beings to other planets. And it all goes back to the invention of farming. But there are negatives that come along with that invention. Things like, for example, social differentiation. What that is, is social classes or hierarchies, right? Now, we're, now we have this issue where there is an elite upper class and a middle class and a lower class, right? Whereas in Paleolithic hunter-gatherer groups, they were egalitarian, right? They were, there was no, you were better than me or I am better than you. It was a communal aspect, right? Which is not a good thing to have social differentiation. But then again, in the long run of it, now we can kind of provide for more people and kind of advance our species, right? Then also, women are going to see a massive drop in political and economic roles, right? Due to the fact that gathering is not necessary anymore, women were going to be reserved mostly to their prim more primitive, like sedentary Paleolithic roles, particularly in the raising and rearing of children, and particularly that of sh like kind of shuttered away uh, jobs in the household. Right? So they're going to lose that economic viability. They're going to lose political participation. Right, So poorer nutrition as well. Hunter-gatherer societies would eat what they needed to eat based on what they had available. And usually nine times out of ten, the earth will provide things that you can actually use, like including proteins and vegetables and other types of greens that you can find, harvest, and eat. Ironically enough, after the farming and Neolithic revolution, we have now depended ourselves mostly on bread and grain crops, which is really, really not as nutritious for you as hearty vegetables and things like that that are a lot harder to grow in certain regions of the world, right? So we actually, ironically enough, have poor nutrition. And here's another really big one, economic inequality, right? So economic inequality is also going to create itself. Along with this social differentiation, you're going to see people who are now poorer and then people who are wealthier. And the number of wealthier people is going to be much smaller, smaller than the group of poorer people that is actually at the bottom, usually encompassing types of small-time labor, right? And then the last one that is not listed on here that I need you to jot down, which is very, very important, and it's kind of a little example of why you should never mute a flip, because I didn't list it on here, but it's very, very important. This other negative, sickness, all right? Viruses, bacteria, and things, diseases, and germs that can kill you are all a result of the Neolithic agricultural revolution. Farming brought us closer to animals. Animals are the people who originally carried viruses like the coronavirus, the flu, the swine flu, tuberculosis, all right? So like all these other types, mumps, measles, rubella, all right? So like they actually carried all these things, but these viruses don't affect them in the same way that they affected human beings. And then eventually the viruses would evolve and mutate and then find ways to affect humans, which we didn't have the immune systems to be able to stop or prevent. We'll sit, talk about this a lot as we go through history. We'll talk about smallpox and its effect on Native American societies. Another big thing about the sickness as well is we can see it happening right now. If, when you get off this computer, when you're done with this flip, go look up the fact that Louisiana reported its first canine case of the COVID-19 virus, right? So like the viruses mutate and they find a way to jump onto other individuals that are living close by, right? It's where it's well, sickness and disease is a big issue amongst the agricultural revolution because we're now closer to animals than we're supposed to be. All right, so, but yeah, so that's it. And then we're, tomorrow we're gonna start talking about the Mesopotamians, kind of the big first large base civilization. I know this is a lot to take in. I know you're all like, man, this guy talks really, really fast. But you can always slow the speed down. The great thing about a flip is you can watch it over and over and over and over and all you want to, okay? But I'll see you guys tomorrow. Y'all have a good one.